this is the Canadian made AR-180B variant. Now this video is a little different to my normal reviews that I do in that this is not really a review. I will talk about this gun and I will talk about the WK-181 or not 181, 180. I will mention the 181. But it's not a review on the rifle specifically. I'm more going to be talking about the Canadian Air 180s in general, why they exist in Canada if anyone doesn't know, and what place they have in Canada going forward. So very briefly, I will mention this rifle. This is an SBI Lynx 180 match lower, which means it can take AR safeties, AR mag releases, AR triggers, AR grips. and on top we have an MCR upper. Now I have it configured like I have most of my AR type guns, so I have the ALG ACT trigger, I have a Magpul MOE, MOE grip, I have MOE stock, I have a foregrip of some variety, this time a Fortis, I have the, I can't remember the name of this brake, I'll put it up on screen, I have some backup irons and I have the trusty old Feiyachi V30. Now, very quickly about the shooting experience with this gun, the way I have it configured, it was very nice for me. It is, this brake is doing a lot of the work, uh, but it is extraordinarily flat shooting. It's maybe the flattest shooting rifle I've ever had or shot, and that includes the Raven. Um, and of course the Raven had this exact same brake on it, this feels a bit flatter shooting. That doesn't mean I recommend this over the Raven at all. It is a nice lower. The Lynx lower is, in my opinion, the best 180 lower you can buy right now. And also I should mention, it does take uh, AR-180 uh, bolt catches. This one is an internal one because that's just what I had for installing in here, but you can of course do the external ones. I do recommend if you are going to build a 180, if you're going to build one, buy the SBI stuff. It is the nicest lowers you can get. Now the why they exist in Canada is twofold. The first reason is because the AR-15 before it was prohibited was restricted, no matter the barrel length. That meant it had to be registered and could only be shot at a range. Now in I believe 20, between 2017 and 2019, I can't remember the year exactly, Kodiak Defense came out with the WK-180. And I have footage of the very earliest 180s, uh, my friend has one, and you'll be seeing a bit of that shooting footage throughout. And that gun was non-restricted because it was based on the AR-180B. Now that one had an FRT of non-restricted which meant any variants that had an 18.6 bar inch barrel or over would also be non-restricted. It was generally deemed an okay gun, had some flaws. It wasn't a super high-end gun, it was a pretty cheap gun, but it was non-restricted, a semi-auto 223, so it's nothing wrong with that. However, when the May 2020 OIC came about and it banned almost every good affordable rifle, the AR-180B was left off the list. Now, that meant that all of these companies had basically one rifle to draw from to manufacture. And the 180 started selling like crazy because it was the most available, semi-auto, affordable 223 that Canada had. And that spawned a whole bunch of other um, variants and stuff. I believe the MCR came along with the WK-180. Um, and then, of course, after that, you had the Gen 2 of the WK-180. You had the Crusader Arms Templar, or as it's known in the U.S., the Crew Arms Templar. You had the Siberian. You had the Sterling Arms R-18. You had SBI, which didn't make a complete rifle. They made just lowers and uppers. This one doesn't have an upper, but they do make an upper. Uh, TNA made a specific lower and upper. Um, I'm probably missing one in my head right now that's not coming to mind. Oh, of course, the WK181 is the 7.62 version of it. So there was a whole bunch of 180s that were made in Canada. Now, 
they all had one major problem, and that was quality control. A lot of these rifles were being pumped out faster than basically anyone should be pumping out a rifle because there were worries about further bans and they wanted to get as much money as possible. And that meant that some development and some manufacturing uh, problems were ignored or were just not paid attention to. And so you had a bunch of quality control issues. For example, with the BCL Siberian, that one had uh, a huge problem with broken firing pins, and a, I believe even a broken bolt carrier, which is crazy. The common thing across the MCRs, the WKs, specifically the 180s, and the Siberians was also broken pistons. Uh, the piston in here, because of the design of the piston, I'll try and put up a picture on screen. Because of the design of the piston, it was flexing too much. That was a design change made from the original Armalite Air 180B, which normally has a cup. Now that cup was eventually put into the WK181, and I believe the Sterling Arms R18 as well, and the piston problem in terms of reliability went away. But all of the other ones, I believe, I'm not entirely sure on the Templar. That one might have the fix as well, but I'm not entirely sure. But the affordable ones, right? The affordable ones are the MCRs and the WKs. And the BCLs to an extent, they're a little more expensive, but they're still generally more affordable. They all had the major problems. And this is where, as some will put, the Canadian 180s became a lottery system because you had some 180s be perfectly good for like 10,000 rounds. Others weren't. They only lasted a couple hundred rounds. And that was primarily due to the piston just being not good. Because the piston was a part that could easily be replaced... That also meant that every time you replaced it, you were running the lottery again. So you might get lucky and get one that lasts 10,000 rounds, or you might get unlucky and get one that only lasts a couple hundred rounds. Now, of course, there are adjustable gas blocks you can use that can kind of help mitigate that, but it's not a guarantee. And a lot of people shy away from these rifles because of that reliability. And in the last year and a half or so with the raven coming onto the market these things are being bought less and less the only reason to be honest that they're still bought over the raven is because the raven is a a bit more expensive and their cheaper model the silver along with the more expensive ones the production time is very slow it they're a very small company so they can only put out so many at a time now, of course, there are other issues that I haven't even mentioned about the Canadian 180s yet. One of them is magazine over-insertion. You'll see that in some of my shooting footage. With some mags, it works just fine. With these cross mags, it's hit or miss. Sometimes the over-insertion will just happen because the spring pressure isn't enough to push it back down. That's annoying. I've had people say that uh, back in Victoria, I had a, a range acquaintance that had his... Uh, the rear end of his buffer on his WK just completely give out multiple times over and over, no matter how much he tightened it properly. Basically, there's a lot of problems. Um, and it's, it's unfortunate. It is unfortunate because the AR-180 system, in theory, has some really good qualities. Now, the number one quality is that in theory, it should be more reliable from in terms of cleaning-wise because of the piston system, but because of the way they designed it, they fucked it, and it's not. <laughs> um, so you really clean your guns. You have to. Uh, which should be standard advice for most things, but in general with the 180s, you should really make sure they are clean. The other big advantage is the fact that you don't need a buffer system, right? You can have a folding stock. Now, this SBI lower has a 
buffer system because they are, in terms of affordability, buffer systems and stocks are by far the cheapest uh, stock option you can get, which is why they're still so common in Canada. However, you can get a plethora of other uh, options. You can get Zukov stocks, you can get ACR stocks like on the Templar, you can get um, pick rail stocks. That's a big benefit of it. They can all fold, they can all get more compact than a buffer system. So that's a nice benefit. However, again, no. However, because of the Canadian manufacturing that has gone on, there are all these problems with the rifles that make them iffy. Now, that's not to say there aren't good ones. The Sterling Arms R18 is an example of an actually very good uh, 180 variant. I don't really see any complaints from R18 owners. The only problem is they're more expensive. Why would you buy that when you could just buy a Raven? With that said, what is the future of these rifles? The future of these rifles is interesting because it entirely depends on if, how, and when law changes come into Canada. Now, we have the Conservative government, which is currently polling to win a super majority, either just under or above the largest majorities in Canadian history. Now, what they do with that majority is the question. Now, currently, they promise that they will make a simplified classification system. That means that we will still have restricted and non-restricted. However, there will be no bands by name, which means a lot of things. That means things like the AK-47 and AKM and AK-whatever, all the Kalashnikovs, we can have them. It will just depend on their barrel length. Same with the AR-15s, we can have them back, except this time, some will be non-restricted because they just need an 18.6 inch barrel. And then all the shorter ones will need will be restricted like they were in the past. That leaves these guns in a very precarious position because AR-15s, thanks to the United States, are super cheap. And because Canada imports a lot of Chinese rifles, I suspect if the AK were to be uh, manufactured again, or, sorry, I suspect if the AK is going to be legal again, we would see Chinese imports of cheap AKs. And if that's the case, well then, these things are really, 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 really not in a good spot. For example, let's look over some of them. You have the Crew Arms, which does work, but it's a bit heavy. If you want a full in-depth review of the Crew Arms slash Crusader Templar, go watch Administrator's Results video on it. It's not necessarily a terrible gun, but it suffers from basic problems like jamming, and it's also too heavy. I know they have released another one that is uh, lower in weight, but I've seen plenty of jamming problems still persist. You have the WKs, which are very cheap. To be fair, they are very cheap, but they're more unreliable than, say, a PSA AR-15. Why would you buy a WK when you could get an AR-15 that is far more reliable and potentially cheaper? It just doesn't make sense. It made sense before because all AR-15s were restricted. But if they become non-restricted and restricted, like every other gun in Canada, well then there's no point to ever buying an AR-180. To make matters worse, some of the perceived benefits can be found in AR-15s. For example, you can get a law tactical folder. You can get uh, bolt carrier and buffer systems that are more compact that still use DI. If you want piston systems, you can buy the PSA Jackal. You can buy the BRN-180 that fits on AR-15 lowers and gives you both of the benefits of foldable stocks and a piston system. And those are proven to be reliable. So why would you ever buy a WK-180 or a WK-181? Or I could go on, all of them. 
the Sterling Arms R18 is the most interesting because, yes, it is the most reliable and most well-made Air 180 in Canada. However, it's expensive, right? It's anywhere between, on the secondary market, 2000 to, if you buy new, upwards of $3,000. Why would you buy that? when you could buy a really high quality AR-15. Why would you buy that when you could buy a Raven right now? Why would you buy that when you could save up just a tiny bit more and buy a Bren? Now, all of that being said, the why shouldn't matter. Why anyone wants to buy any specific gun is up to them. Maybe they like the way it looks. Maybe they want something that's Canadian made. Maybe they want some specific kind of feature that they can't get elsewhere. Nothing's coming to mind now, but maybe they want that. The AR-180Bs will not, as we see them in Canada now, will not have a place in the Canadian market following that rule change. If that rule change never occurs, we're going to be using these things for decades, and hopefully they'll get better. But assuming that rule change does come into place, all of these AR-180Bs are just going to be useless. They're going to be stripped of their parts and put towards AR-15s or other things. However, with that said, that's my opinion. Someone else might feel differently. And like I said, someone might want a Canadian-made rifle, or maybe they want this specifically, and they could still buy them and use them because the point of having these available is options. We see that in the United States. Every year at NRAN or SHOT Show, we see countless rifles that come out that are not AR-15s, and the public go crazy for them because they're simply not AR-15s, because the AR-15 has become boring in the United States. They want variety for the sake of interest. We are forced to use the variety out of necessity. And that's not a good thing. What the United States has in terms of variety is what we should have. All of these different options, we can pick what we want, we can use what we want, and because of the competition that will occur, hopefully we get better products. You see it in the United States with firearms manufacturers all the time. Because there are so many manufacturers in the United States, and there are so many options for you to choose from, the quality of firearms on average is much higher. Yes, of course there are exceptions. The United States, or any country for that matter, isn't immune to bad manufacturers. That's always going to happen. But manufacturers will often put more time and effort into it because they know that they're going to have to go up against stronger competition. Now, of course, the one element that I haven't talked about in terms of the future is bans. Now, whether you like it or not, there will be another government after the conservative government, right? There will be a liberal or an NDP government, depending on how much the liberals collapse. And gun bans and stuff will always, always, always be on the agenda of the Liberal Party because of the influences from lobbying members. And to be honest, there's nothing that we can do in terms of the Liberal Party itself and their agenda. The most we can do is just keep buying, using firearms, teaching people how to use firearms safely, and the sport of firearms. That is the best we can do to prevent against future bans, and that's really it. There's no other way to put it. That is it for this video. I hope you enjoyed a bit of a different video looking at the AR-180s. If you're not from Canada and you found it interesting of why we have all these AR-180s, well now you know. And maybe you think differently. Maybe you can see somewhere the Air 180s go in Canada in the future that I can't. And if you do, leave a comment. I'd be open to seeing how these things, how you think these rifles will work in Canada in the future. So, that's it for this video. Thank you very much for watching, and have a good day.